So tonight we begin a new series on the doctrines of grace. It's also called or known as Reformed Theology, or it's also called Calvinism by its least popular form. Uh, Many people dislike when you start to talk about the doctrines of grace, especially if you use the word Calvinism. That triggers a whole lot of things, and I think there's a couple reasons why. Um, This has been kind of my experience, some of the real severe pushback. Uh, The first one is, it's a direct attack on the ego. So when you understand what it is that the doctrines of grace say about the state of humanity and the condition of humanity, it has an exceptionally low view of humans and a very high view of God. So anyone that want to espouse this intrinsic value and worth and specialness in human beings that somehow warrants the grace and mercy of God, uh, the doctrines of grace are a direct attack on that, number one. Number two, that a proper understanding of these doctrines takes from people something that they love to hold on to which is any sense of control over their lives or circumstances. Any sense of, I'm in control, I determine what happens with my life, um, I'm kind of the, the mover of the pieces. And when we understand the doctrines of grace, we understand, no, no, that's not it at all. And so, because it's an attack on the ego, and because it's an attack on the fact that we love control and love to control things as much as possible, I think that there's, uh, there's an kind of unpopularity to this in a lot of evangelical circles um, because it aggressively says people are not good and people are not in control. Now, as we study God's sovereignty and our salvation, that's really what the doctrines of grace are about. It's about the intersection of the sovereignty of God and how it has to do with the salvation and the choice of people. I believe that to accept what it seems that the scriptures clearly teach Uh, will be, for those who do so, a source of deep and abiding joy. I think that there is a a rest and a security and a joy and a peace that comes from accepting these doctrines. There's one preacher, as I really enjoy, likes to put it, it's like a warm blanket for the soul. That once you start to think a little bit less of yourself and think a little bit more of God and understand the dynamic of Him and us, you can rest secure in that place. Um, not having to hold on to control and not having to think so much of yourself. So what we're going to study is captured in what's known as the very famous acrostic tulip, T-U-L-I-P, which is why I've titled this series, The Most Beautiful Flower in God's Garden, that being the tulip. Uh, And tonight we're going to be looking at the T of tulip, which is total depravity, also called Uh, utter depravity or radical corruption, but we're going to stick with the acrostic because um, otherwise we'd lose the whole flower imagery and all the time I spent on putting this graphic together would go to waste and I don't want that, so this is what we're going to do. Now, in order to get this, there's a place we need to start. So, I think one of the the dangerous things to do when, when addressing the doctrines of grace is to Uh, just kind of get right into a lot of the New Testament passages that speak about the human condition, because really where it all starts is at the fall. So the fall of Adam and Eve and how that event affects the rest of humanity is central to the doctrines of grace and to understanding this. So uh, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. We're going to go all the way to the beginning. Because we need to understand the picture of humanity before the fall and then the picture of humanity after the fall to see what has happened and how whatever it is that has happened has been uh, so detrimental and, and, and so much a central part of the doctrines of grace, specifically total depravity. So Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Then God God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heaven, and over livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
So there's a whole sermon on what it means to be made in the image of God. So let me try to summarize this as briefly as I possibly can. To be made in the image of God means to bear his image, to share in his qualities, and to reflect to the world this is what God is like. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. It means that we share in the what theologians call communicable attributes of God. There are attributes of God that we can't share in. For example, God's, uh, God's um, omniscience. He knows everything. We can't share in that. We can't share in God's omnipresence, being everywhere at once. But there are commu- those are the incommunicable attributes. But then there are communicable attributes. So God is creative. He's creator. And so he has made us to be creative. Right? God is the standard for love. And he's created us to be loving creatures. God is patient. He's long-suffering. And so he's made us to be that way. So being made in his image, here you have Adam and Eve and people are made to share and kind of share some of the qualities, bear the qualities of God, and communicate to the world, this is what God is like. So we have been made to be patient, so when we show patience, what we're showing to the rest of the world is, this is what God is like. He's ultimately patient. Or this is what God is like. He's ultimately loving. Does that make sense? It's a very brief what it means to be made in the image of God and to reflect who he is to the world around us. That is very important in our understanding tonight. So let's fast forward. Genesis chapter 2. So Genesis 1, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the kind of the the, the literature here, Genesis 1 is like a wide-angle view of the creation narrative. Genesis chapter 2 basically focuses right in on one day, and specifically Adam and Eve. So Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God takes Adam and says to him, Do you see what this garden looks like? Your job is to make the rest of the world look like this. Your job is to cultivate so that you bring order and beauty to the rest of the world, which at this point was totally wild and untamed landscape. So, so that's the job. Your job is to bring order and beauty and structure to the rest of the world, like what I've shown you here in this garden. And then he says to him, and there's one, one command I have for you. In terms of a do not do. There's one negative command. You can't eat from the fruit of this particular tree. So at this point, theologians, especially someone like Augustine, will say that Adam and subsequently Eve had the ability to choose to either obey or disobey God. They they possessed within them the ability to obey God simply because of how he's made them. Or disobey God because they had that ability to make that volitional choice. Now in Genesis chapter 3, they disobey. They eat the fruit of the tree. And sin comes into the world. Sin comes into the creative order. And we see a couple things. We see that the relationship between God and humans is broken. That this sweet fellowship is now replaced by fear and shame. We also see that the relationship between Adam and Eve is broken as he blames her and she blames the snake. But really, if you look at Adam's language, he blames God, right? He says, the woman that you gave me did this. So we just see relationships fractured and we just see corruption everywhere in the creative order. Death also enters the world now. So now for the first time, human beings and other animals taste death which was never a part of the original design. Sin has now effectively marred creation as a result of the fall. And there's relational and spiritual and even vocational death. God tells Adam, so here's your punishment. You're going to work hard and it's going to be tremendously difficult and then you're going to die. Go for it. So there's all these faces of death that we see as a result of the fall. 
Now, in Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul speaks of what happened at the fall and, and what that translates to for the rest of humanity. And this is at this point, we're going to now really begin to look more specifically at, at the idea of total depravity. But we need to start here. We have to start with the condition of humanity before the fall and see what has happened as a result of the fall. Otherwise, the whole thing falls apart. So, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, talked about that, the various forms of death, spiritual, relational, and vocational, and physical death as well. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. I don't have the time to really dig at that verse. There's two interpretations. One interpretation is because everyone continually sins, we see the effect of death. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily correct because we see this corruption before people even make the choice to sin. So I think what Paul is saying here is Adam is our representative. So Adam as the first human being is kind of like our elected official. And really... If we're going to pick someone to represent us, Adam's the best choice because he is a man that up until this point had not been affected by sin. So he's really the best shot we have at obedience. And so because he's our representative, because he sins, all of us are affected. I think that's what he means when he says death comes and then all have sinned. We've all sinned because as our representative, he has sinned. This is the first blank in your notes. The effects of the fall and sin have corrupted all of humanity. All, every single human being from Adam until now, corrupted in some way by the effects of the fall and sin. So what are the effects of the fall and sin as we see them playing out in humanity? Well, we've already talked about this. Yeah, there's a physical death. People get sick. We die. Other things die. Things deteriorate. There's relational death. Um, I'd be hard-pressed to find a person that can say that there exists in their life one relationship that is always marked by honesty and purity and a sincere selfless love for the other person. Anyone who tells me they have one relationship like that, they're lying. No one, every relationship you have, if you were to be honest with yourself, every relationship that you have, self-interest, self-centeredness, pride, selfishness, it creeps up eventually. You might be able to control it with some people better than others, but every relationship we have, there's this constant battle that the flesh desires putting our needs above the other person. I'm talking about spouses, I'm talking about kids, doesn't matter. They're all affected by it. But what I want to focus on tonight, and I think we need to focus on in understanding the doctrines of grace, is the spiritual death. This separation from God, this sense of broken relationship and fellowship with the Creator and all that that entails. In Ephesians chapter 2, Verses 1 to 3. And if you've, if you've been around me for any period of time, it's like I can't go three or four sermons without in some way, shape, or form referencing this verse because I think that our understanding of us and how we relate to God is, it has a lot to do with what Paul's talking about in this passage. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Now he's speaking to believers... And he's saying to them, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So let's... Let's unpack this quickly because, again, this is a whole other sermon. You could do a sermon per verse here, but, but 
what we're seeing here is that people are spiritually dead apart from whatever work God does in their life. Now, it's not just that they're spiritually dead. Paul would say they're taking their cue from Satan. They're simply following the pattern of the world, and they are helplessly enslaved to their own fleshly desires, that that's all they're doing is pursuing anything other than obedience to God. And he says, and this was all of us, every single one of us, apart from whatever it is that God did, we were all here. And this is strong language when he says that we were by nature children of wrath, which is another way of saying all we deserved was the fullness of the wrath of God poured furiously upon us. So this corruption is something that's not learned. This corruption is not something that you gain after a number of years of being alive. This corruption, when he says here, you know, at work in the sons of disobedience, this corruption is something that's there from birth. And the scriptures confirm this idea. Uh, The two main examples I like to go to, the first one is Psalm 51, verse 5. And this is what David writes. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And iniquity means what should be straight is crooked. There's a bent And it's not the way that it should be. So I was brought forth into this world in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Even at the moment of conception, I'm so marked by sin. Not goodness and virtue and and wonderful, um, valuable awesomeness. That's not what defines people. Uh, Probably on the next page for you, uh, Psalm 58 Verse 3, this is what we read. The wicked are estranged, where? From the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. I want to talk about my boys for a second here. Um, I love my boys tremendously. Yeah, I, 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 I never imagined that I would have so much love and, and, and a desire to protect and see the well-being of another human being, such a tiny human being that I, I haven't even known for that long. Like, before they were born, I was madly in love with them. I hadn't even seen them yet. That's how I feel about my boys. i got to get that out of the way first. Um, my boys are not little angels, right? We all might know that. I know that better than anyone here. They are definitely not little angels, I didn't teach my boys how to hit other people when they're upset. I didn't teach them how to throw things when they're upset. I didn't teach them how to bite another child when they're upset. They didn't see me do that to Catherine. Catherine and I don't get in fights and I bite her, right? Like that's not how we operate in our home. They didn't learn that from me. They didn't, where did that come from? It didn't come from anywhere else. They didn't see it. They don't see it in their TV shows. It came from in here. Right? They were born with this wickedness. Like just this rebellious, arrogant... Like my, my boys are selfish narcissists. And Catherine and I are going to have to try furiously to work that out of them as best as we can so that they just don't go around killing other kids ultimately wanting to teach them the gospel so that we understand that God changes their heart, not just behavior modification. But here's what I'm convinced of, of my kids, and I've heard another preacher say this. The only thing that is stopping one- and two-year-old kids from killing other people to get what they want is just their size. I'm convinced that if my boys had my size and my strength, I'd be done. There's nothing that would stop them from eliminating me to get his juice or to get his cookies. That's the depth of the corruption. Okay? And for those of us who have kids, we know, right? We know. There's no, we're not, there's no fairy tale here about little angels. We know what's in them. So I want to talk about some of the 
or I wanted I, I wanted to define for us a little more clearly and really put some meat on okay so what is the what what are the deep effects of this corruption then so this corruption is there and I've given a couple symptoms right selfishness self-centeredness right violence but but really I want to put some good definitions to this and this is where we get the idea of the doctrine of total depravity so this is the second blank in your notes this is a lengthy definition I know you can your own in your own personal life you can summarize it and shorten it if you want but I think this is this is pretty um, pretty all-encompassing Total depravity means that our rebellion against God is total. That all we do is rebel. Everything we do in this rebellion is sin. Our inability to submit to God or reform ourselves is total. And we are therefore totally deserving of eternal punishment. Total depravity does not mean that everyone is as bad as they possibly could be. We're not. I don't think all of us are full tilt as evil as we possibly, possibly could be. That's not what it means. But what total depravity means is that all of who I am, my will, my desire, my thoughts, all of it is so depraved that I cannot in and of myself choose good or do good or come to God. And because of that, what I totally deserve for that is sin and death and and punishment okay we are totally corrupt all of who we are Uh, and in Romans chapter 3 the apostle Paul in quoting a series of Old Testament passages uh, offers a very delightful and lighthearted take on humanity I'm obviously being sarcastic Romans chapter 3 verses 10 to 18 as it is written None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. So I don't understand how anyone can read a verse like that and come to the conclusion that that we need to have seeker-sensitive services when the scriptures tell us that no one seeks for God. But whatever, that's just me. Um, All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In this corruption, we can do no good thing apart from God. Now, I'm going to say something that is scandalous to actually say publicly. And I think that if we were to actually honestly communicate this way with other churchgoers and non-believers, this would be met with such hostility. I, I know this for a fact. That's why I've been careful, not because I've been afraid, but because if I'm going to, if I'm going to communicate this, I need to pick my battle well. But here's the here's the awful truth if you are not a follower of Christ having been saved by the grace of God having had your soul and heart regenerated everything you do even the seemingly good things are actually awfully wicked sins let me tell you why I've said that and let me show you why I've said that Let's look at the example of someone who, in their selfless, giving nature, decides to give a tremendous amount of money to charity, and then goes over to a developing country and and helps to do a great work with the children who are there, and then comes back home and volunteers so much at the soup kitchen, at the food bank. If such a person is not doing these things out of a deep thankfulness for the mercy that God has extended to him or her and a deep desire to want to honor him and praise him and and glorify him with everything that they do, what are the possible reasons why they're doing what they're doing? Well, maybe they're doing it because in their mind, 
the value of this person who's on the receiving end of this gracious work is utmost. Or maybe it's just the altruism. Maybe it's the idea, the ideal of the doing good that is utmost. Or maybe they feel good about themselves in a way, and so that provides them with some measure of satisfaction and, and meaning. And so that's utmost. Now, here's, here's where this starts to make sense. Anytime we look for the deepest meaning and purpose and satisfaction in anything apart from our Creator, He has told us in His Word that is idolatry. So the person, and this is the, you can see why this is scandalous, the person who donates millions of dollars to charity but does not do it out of a heart that has been gripped by the Savior is a person who commits idolatry. So the act of writing a check to orphans in need done for any reason other than to glorify the king, listen, is wickedness. That's crazy to say that. But that's how we understand idolatry and worship. And so that's why, that's, this is where total depravity starts to make sense. It starts to make sense because even the good things are really not good things because if the scriptures tell us do all things for the glory of God, then anything that is not done for the glory of God is sin. It's idolatry. And so every person, even when they try to do good things, all they're really doing is earning the wrath of God. Now, I... That sounds so harsh to say. And I I know that sounds harsh to say. But biblically, you'd be hard-pressed to show me or anyone how that's not the case. right? Especially if even our righteousness is like filthy rags to him. You'd be hard-pressed to show biblically how something that is done to worship something or someone else other than God isn't just wicked idolatry. So that's, okay, this is, the, this is how deep the corruption is. All we can do is sin. The only thing a non-believer can do is sin. They can never not sin. They are constantly sinning. That's the picture I'm trying to get at here. All the time, 24-7, even their good things, all they're doing is sinning. That's how deep this corruption is. And we can't help but sin. Apart from God. There's, there's no ability to snap out of it and say, you know what? All of a sudden now, I think I'm going to do something for the glory of God. That, that is not something that occurs in the unregenerate heart. There's no ability to do God. We can't come to God or choose Him on our own. And again, in Romans, this time in chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is going to spell this out in a little bit more detail for us. Romans 5, 5 to 8. This is what he writes. Romans 8, 5 to 8. Romans 5 is coming a little bit later. Romans 8, 5 to 8. For those who live according to the flesh here, unsaved, set their minds on the things of the flesh. That's all they're pursuing. But those who live according to the Spirit here, one who's been saved by God, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Listen to verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh, someone who is unsaved, is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law, indeed, it cannot. Now look at verse 8, because verse 8 is awful. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. I'm, I'm I'm, I'm not making this up. This is here in the scriptures, that those who are unsaved can never please God. Never. There's nothing they can do 
apart from being given new life, that can please God. Everything they do is an offense to him. That's the depth of the corruption. Now, this is pretty awful news. Like this, this does not bode well for anyone who is unsaved. And really, e- even those of us who are believers, you know, think back. Then how am I here? Like what happened? What was the exchange that took place that now Paul would say, but now my mind is set on the spirit. What happened? Um, because the question is, how do people get saved? Or how is it that a person can actually please God? Because the scriptures are full of people who God is pleased with. So what, what's, what happens to get from that to that? Well, I'm not going to tell you um, really because that's going to be the remainder of our series. The remainder of the series is to answer the question that how is it the people in this condition could ever get to the place where they could love and serve and please God so that he doesn't look at them and see nothing but sinful, selfish, wicked idolatry. What happens? Well, let me tell you what doesn't happen. Okay, let's get this out of the way. Here's what does not happen in order to take a person from this condition to be saved and pleasing God. It's not because they they prayed some prayer to God. That is not what does it. There is no, there's a preacher I really love to listen to, and you know some of the stuff he says, especially in this regard, can be pretty scandalous, but he basically compares the sinner's prayer to an incantation that's practiced in witchcraft, right? Because what's an incantation? Repeat the words, and it elicits a response. You repeat the words, and it's almost as if, if I say the right words, God's up there in heaven, and he's like, well, what choice do I have now? I mean, they prayed the prayer. I might as well, poof, new life, right? Like this, it's, it's witchcraft. That's what it is. So it didn't happen because they said the right words and unlocked salvation. That's not how they went from this condition to being saved. It's certainly not because they initiated and, um, and asked God and he said, okay, because Romans 8 is, is abundantly clear, that doesn't happen. No one comes to God. No one seeks him. No one pleases him apart from whatever it is that he does. So it's not because they initiated. And it's not because they came to him on their own. No, this is something I've, I've learned in my life. And I'm intentional when, when I, with the language that I use. And I want to encourage us to grow in our intentionality. And I've said this many, many times uh, in sermons and, 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 and you know, privately or publicly if someone asks you the question, when did you become a Christian? Or how did you get saved? If the first word in your answer is I, pray to prayer, I believed, I repented, I, that's the wrong answer. The correct answer is God saved me. So when people ask me, when did you become a Christian? Or what I'm trying to tell them how long I've been a Christian, I'll be very clear. God saved me when I was 16. He saved me. I didn't come to him and say, save me please. Right? The the example is, or, or an example would be um, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus wasn't on the inside of the tomb knocking, saying, Jesus, let me out. It's dark in here. He was dead. He smelled. And Jesus rolled the stone away and commanded that life happen. He wasn't asking for it. He wasn't looking for it. He was dead, and life found him. Okay, the scriptures are clear. Our corruption is total. We're powerless to save ourselves from sin. We are in need of outside help for our salvation. The tools that are required for salvation do not exist in the individual. I don't got them. We don't got them. There's somewhere else, something outside of us that is required. Now, this is not only biblically true and accurate, but this is also the first petal on the flower we're studying. That the rest of the tulip doesn't make sense and, and, and doesn't flow unless we get this truth here. The corruption is so total that all we can do is sin. We are helpless and powerless to sin and we are never pleasing God apart from what he does. Now that's the badness, the terrible, awful news. 
But there's good news. And as we're going to see in our study over the next five weeks or so, is that God has made a way for our salvation. That God has made a way so that people in this condition can be saved and can know him and can love him and can serve him. And the way is, very simply, through the obedient life, sacrificial death, and glorious resurrection of Jesus. In those events, he atones or he pays for the sins of God's children and his perfect righteousness. So he lived a life where all he did was obey. All he did was please God. And, and that righteousness that he earned, in some way, God imputes that. He gives that to us. We haven't earned it. We don't deserve it. But he gives it to us. And his resurrection is our way of knowing that the payment was made in full. That our resurrection is our way of knowing that whatever he did, that was acceptable to God. And so we can trust that what he offers us is legitimate and full and complete. But we have to begin with the very true and the very bad news. And that is that we're not good people. We're not. There is no intrinsic goodness. People are not blank slates when they're born. They're affected by environment. People are born with iniquity, a crookedness, a bent towards wickedness and rebellion and evil. People are wretched apart from God. We must, as the scriptures, have a very low view of humanity. A very low view of humanity. Now, this... Here's what we're going to see as we move forward in this. Not a low view of humanity and so everyone's worthless and I treat everyone like garbage. No, no, no. But we have to have this low view of not being good, not being able to do good to to come to God. Okay, this low view of man has to be contrasted with the very high view of God. Right? That's the only way this makes sense. If we don't begin with the depth of our corruption, okay, a study of total depravity and people apart from God, I've already said this, we're not going to get the rest of the doctrines of grace. The U, the L, the I, and the P don't make sense and don't hold up unless we start here. This is where we need to begin. And I believe that we'll miss the truth of the gospel if it doesn't start here. Any time the gospel is shared that doesn't begin with, here's the problem, might not necessarily turn out to be a very honest and accurate proclamation of the gospel. It has to start with, here's the bad news. That way the good news can be ushered in in its place, but it has to start here. And we need to remember that our depravity is not too much for God. Our depravity is not so total that he can't do something about it. He can't overcome it in some way. He can't do what he does to save us, even though our depravity is so total. And if anyone can save sinful people like us, it's him. Right? We, we need to be assured that it's him. So uh, I want to offer a little glimmer of the good news, but I, we need to end tonight. There needs to be a heaviness to it. We need to understand this honest state of humanity and, and the depth of corruption, the total depravity. We got we to gotta sit in that for a week before we can come back and then begin to look at, okay, so what's the good news? What, what is God going to do about this? What is he going to do about this?